Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about a man who is oftentimes considered to have been the architect of the Cold War for his role in creating the containment policy that the United States employed against the Soviet Union. He was also a man who had become one of its most forceful critics and warned that the United States was heading towards a more disastrous foreign policy. He would be a serious critic of every war since. The man's name is George Kennan. And my guest to talk about George Kennan is Frank Costigliola. Frank Costigliola is the Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. And he is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about called Kennan, A Life Between Worlds. Frank Costigliola, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's interesting George Kennan, not in every way, this will be obvious, but in some ways reminds me of T.E. Lawrence uh, during World War I times. And what I mean by that is George Kennan was a real admirer of Russian culture who immersed himself in Russian culture. He lived in Russia. Uh, in some, he, he didn't lead a, a guerrilla warfare, uh, but in some ways, that when, when I was reading the beginning of your book, it reminded me of T.E. Lawrence, the way, you know, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, as somebody who would also, um, who himself immense himself into the, the Arab world at the time. Yeah, that, that's a very good analogy. I had not thought of that before, but it's a good analogy in part because in a way, in a way, Kennan waged after he left office in 1950, uh, he waged in a, way, a guerrilla war against U.S. foreign policy uh, in, in terms of uh, the confrontational aspect of, of U.S. policy, particularly with regard to Russia. I mean, he was he worked within the establishment, uh, although he also you know critiqued it, and and it was kind of a guerrilla war. I think that's not that's not a bad analogy in some ways. Yeah, that's interesting too. But for me, it was what I was thinking was his immersion uh, right. into to Russian culture. Tell tell me about. Uh, George Kennan and in the Russian world, right? I, I think that in, I think you could argue that Kennan is, may very well have been the U.S. official, U.S. State Department official, who knew Russia better than anyone before or, or since. Um, uh, he uh, learned Russian. He learned to speak Russian like a native, which and he didn't have it from childhood. That's another thing about his language ability. He, he spoke just as a native German and. Uh, and uh, Russian as well as English, as well as other languages. But he picked up, uh, he, he studied Russian very intensively starting in his mid 20s. He read all literature, particularly 19th century, early 20th century Russian literature. Uh, he thought for many years he was going to write a biography of Chekhov, and we can talk more about that because the re reason he didn't, I think, is as significant as what he thought about Chekhov. And Chekhov influenced him in many ways with regard to uh, views of, of, uh, machines and industry and relations among people. Um, he read as a diplomat, and then l later he read the newspapers intensively. He read the official uh, Soviet documents and later the Russian documents, reading between the lines. Uh, he loved to he loved to dress up as an ordinary Russian and uh, just listen to people on the streetcars, listen to people uh, talking in the theater intermission, uh, walking on the streets. He would... Uh, ski off this is you know back back in the day before the spread of suburbs so much in moscow but he would in winter time take his cross-country skis and go skiing off to find uh, search out some gem of russian uh, early russian architecture some church um he it, it, it had many russian friends uh, in the early 30s when it was permissible to do this partied with russians late into the night <laughs> um he was you know, and at, at one point, at one point, this is, I think I have this at the beginning of the book. Uh, he was, uh, he was, I think was in London and he saw a performance of uh, uh, Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. And he, and he, and that brought him to tears. It moved him so much that it brought him to tears. And he said at that point, he said that in some respects, my Russian self is more genuine than my American self. So that that's quite a statement for America's strategist in the Cold War. Anton Chekhov again, great Russian playwright. Mm -hmm. Tell right. tell me the the influence of Chekhov's work on on George Kennan, and also you, and you write this in your introduction. He was a, a big admirer of Leo Tolstoy as well. So yeah. I, I'm assuming he's just a big admirer of Russian literature <clears throat> as as many people yeah, are. Yeah, particularly Chekhov. <clears throat> Chekhov, who wrote, of course, many short stories as well as as well as plays, and Kennan uh, admired Chekhov's tragic view of 
of life. Um, that, 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 that Chekhov really got into the <clears throat> kind of interaction of, of Russian people, you know, people who were like, at the same time, heroic and pathetic, you know, people who, who have a lot of pathos in their life, uh, the daily lives of people who, who then who think deeply about the situation they're in. People think about the human condition and are not superficial in their, in their, in their judgments. That's something Kennan, Kennan admired. Um, and, but in particular, <clears throat> what I think is really significant, significant in terms of today, today is that Kennan picked up on Chekhov's view that the real problem in modern society, the, and this is, of course, during the days when you have ideological conflict between communism and capitalism, but it pertains to today. But the real problem in, in, in modern society is not whether the machines are owned by, the, the factories are owned by the capitalists or owned by communists, but the fact that it's machine production, that the, the items we use in our daily lives, the way you know pe many people make their living is through dependence on use of machines. And Chekhov said, and this I think is fascinating, that this was a mistake and a misunderstanding. A mistake and a misunderstanding of how human beings should relate to the environment, to nature, and how human beings should relate to each other. Now think about that. It's a mistake. It's a misunderstanding. It's, that's like a, a fundamental critique, right, of, of uh, an aspect of, of economic life, which is still still dominating, obviously. Our world. They used, Kennan thought, like Chekhov, you should have far fewer consumer products, but much more things that were made by artisan, artisanal. And you could see this now, and certainly in the Berkeley area, you know, this. So I think this would resonate that, um, you know, the people need to feel pride in the things they have in their daily life. Uh, people need, 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 need to feel pride and ownership in the things they manufacture. And machine production is, uh, is, Corrupting of that, corrupting of not just the workers, and and not just sad and and, and deleterious, not just for the workers, but for the factory owners themselves. Today, we, we say the stockholders who are alienated from what's really basic in 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 their uh, economic life. Now, George Kennan would be a diplomat. Uh, he would he was. serve he was in Russia years. during the Roosevelt administration. And uh, the Truman administration, and then, yeah, Roosevelt and Truman administration. But let's begin with the Roosevelt uh, administration. Mm -hmm. the, it, it, it was FDR who would once again normalize relations with Russia after the Russian Revolution. And That's George right, Kennan is a part of this. Yeah. I'm right. sorry, George it, Kennan is a part of this. It. I'm sorry, say it again. George Kennan yeah. is a part of this. Yeah, he is, yes. He, um, so Roosevelt recognized the Soviet Union in November 1933. This was 16 years after the Bolshevik Revolution. And Kennan, as a junior diplomat, as a translator, went in with William Bullitt, who's a character in his own right, uh, who was the first American ambassador to the Soviet Union in December, December 1933. And Kennan was there from 30, late 33 until 1938, and then again from 1944 to 1946. And he was ambassador for four brief, tragic months in 1952. So that's you know that's the period that he was a diplomat in in, in russia momentous times so all, all three eras tell me about george kennan in in the soviet union in the 1930s uh tell me about his relationship to <clears throat> the bolsheviks <clears throat> well you have to remember that in the early 1930s um this is before stalin's purges which which killed off many of the most idealistic um uh, humanistic, Western-influenced Bolsheviks. Um, the Soviet Union was a different kind of a place. It was a place where it was it was happening, okay? Uh, there are a lot of American uh, artists there. Paul Robeson uh, spent time in Moscow when Kennan was first there in 33 and 34. Uh, uh, Harpo Marx had some performances there and, you know, to great, great acclaim. There was a lot of literary production. Uh, this was an American's Americans and people from other countries as well who thought that capitalism capitalism had failed, this is the height of the Great Depression, went to Russia to look for a new model, um, you know, and um, and many Russians genuinely believed that they were creating, they had, there was a sense of excitement, creativity, that people were fashioning a new human being and new relations among people. 
and Kenan was there during this ferment, um, and when there was a lot of open open contact between Russians and between Americans, as I said, parties till early the next morning, dancing, uh, excuse me, ice skating on the frozen rivers of, of Moscow to, to music that's played in, from the shore. I mean, this was an exciting time that's for a young man, as he was a young man, and for the other and a lot of the other diplomats who went in with Bullet were also young men. And uh, there was also a certain amount of sexual kind of excitement uh, as a way to kind of encourage ties between the Americans and the Russians, both the U.S. and, and the Soviet governments approved of the Bolshoi ballerinas, basically, as Bullet said, having free run of the embassy. Um, you know, and there was the idea, of course, that these ballerinas might report back. But so what? So what? The Americans had nothing to hide. Uh, also, Bullet. Uh, introduced baseball, tried to introduce polo. I mean, there was a sense of cultural exchange. And Kennan Kennan was excited about all that. Again, he gets there early 1934. Um, Uh, But later, that same year in December, we have the murder of Sergei Kirov. Right. And this would would set off a great purge that would happen uh, by Joseph Stalin. T- tell me more about the significance of the murder of Sergei Kirov, how right. the purge well, would affect Kirov, him. Kirov, Kirov, Kirov was a very popular figure. Uh, in some respects, if there was a rival to Stalin, he was that. And um, it's still a certain amount of mystery whether how the circumstances of his assassination, whether Stalin you know, instigated that or someone else, and then Stalin took advantage of it. Um, in any case, what started in the the year 1934 is kind of this magical interlude. So this happens, the assassination is at the end of it, right? <clears throat> but in, in some respects, that 34 was a kind of a, 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 a kind of paradise year that neither Kennan nor the other Americans who went there could ever get over. It was like this kind of remembrance of their lost youth, so to speak, magical moment. Okay, but then the purges which started some in 35, but in, more intensely in 36, 37, 38, uh, were just totally brutal. And also, in a sense, they got out of even out of Stalin's hands, where this was a, a opportunity for anyone who wanted to denounce uh, s- someone else, particularly someone who above them in the party apparatus could charge uh, that, that person with being uh, disloyal or sabotaging events. Or, you know, this was the time the Soviet Union was rapidly industrializing, the five-year plans. And a lot of things were done sloppily. So you had trains derailing because the tracks were not laid properly or you know, it was mistakes, it was like mine disasters and so forth. And Stalin and the people around him saw the, these natural disasters as all sabotage. That there was, this was all, someone was, you know, someone was plotting. And there was, to be fair, I mean, this is not to excuse it or justify it, but there was a certain amount of foreign, uh, I'm thinking about here, Japanese and Polish and um, German uh, sending agents into Russia to sabotage things. So there's a small amount of actual sabotage, which is greatly exaggerated uh, by Stalin and the people around him, who then, as Stalin put it, if, if we only 5% of the people we, we get rid of are guilty, so what? It's worth it. Um, this also was a purge of the Red Army. Uh, the Red Army, most of the top officers of the Red Army were purged, executed, or exiled. Um, but looking ahead, when the Germans invaded, the, that allowed younger officers, more innovative officers, to rise to the top. And that's one reason that the Red Army did, after initial defeats, did so well in World War II. But in any case, for Stalin, excuse me, for, for Kennan, for Kennan, who part, had partied and had talked intellectual exchanges and just had fun with many of these figures, Radek, um, Bukharin, and others, it was, it was a terrible, a terrible letdown. I mean, and also, as part of the, the purges and the crackdown on the openness that had existed before, uh, Stalin and the people around him made it uh, a, a crime, basically a crime for, for Russians to have contact with foreigners. And so the, what had been the situation of many prominent Soviets attending American parties and, and, and being open in terms of talking about political happenings and so forth, uh, diplomatic things, that all shut down. And it was like an icy Siberian blast that um, was, was, again, it was, I think you cannot exaggerate too much how, what a profound perf- personal as well as political, political impact 
that the purges had on canon, the people who had experienced the excitement of 34, some put it the badness of 34 in a good way, and then the subsequent. Yeah, really, Frigid. really momentous uh, year. Yes, Such a significant yes, yes, year. Yes. So, so Keenan was, was friends with Nikolai Bukharin, who yes, is, is yes, remembered fondly as a, as a communist afterwards and still up yes, to date. Yeah, right, right. And in fact, um, Ken, one of Kennan's uh, most insightful reports to the State Department in 1937, I think, right around in there, was an analysis of what Bukharin's um, experience was like being persecuted by Stalin. And what's interesting in that dispatch that Kennan sent, a lengthy dispatch, it's hard at times to see where Kennan is talking about his reaction to Bukharin's persecution and Bukharin's own reaction to his persecution. In other words, Kennan was identified. Mm. That's interesting. So, so Kennan is not necessarily a, a rabid anti-communist. No, he's, he's not, not a communist I mean, either, though. I think no, no, not say. at all. Certainly yeah. not a communist. I would say number one, not a communist. But he also, he also was not a fan of capitalism. He thought it had been influenced by the, the Great Depression. He thought you know overproduction was an endemic problem of capitalism. He thought this should be more of like a planned economy. Um, rather than, you know, all out free market capitalism or certainly not communism. He thought communism was too restricted. He also thought the communism might be okay for Russia, given its economic political conditions, but it was not really or should not be exportable. It was certainly inappropriate for most other countries, too much, too much of a too authoritarian. Let me move the story forward a little bit here, because eventually yeah. I want to spend a good amount of time about his critiques towards the Cold War. But before yeah. we get there, I think we should talk about how he would end up becoming what many consider to be actually the architect of the Cold War. So what right. happens after this period of time? So to you know, make a long story just manageable here, um, by 1940, Kennedy went back into Russia in 44. And that the restraints, the restraints on activities of foreigners interacting with Russians, they're all they've been eased somewhat during the war, but still not. And in Kennan was he went goes back there and you see, I think you see from the book, he feels this real sense, this emotional, ah, it's so good to be back. Oh, you know, I love these people, the Russian people. I love this culture. And yet he comes up sharp that he realizes that there are limits that a foreigner cannot really associate freely with Russians and and and, and this you know that he's always going to remain a foreigner, always going to be remain a, a feared foreigner. And he's so he's bitter about that. He's also as someone who witnessed the purges, he sees the expansion of the Stalinist police state into Poland and the other countries of Eastern Europe. I mean he remembered what that police state had done to his friends in the late 1930s, and now that police state it's not just Russia, but it's the police state, uh, secret police and all that, that's being exported to countries of Eastern Europe. So he's, he's angry about that. He's also angry that the U.S. government is not listening to him. I mean, Kennan, let me just say, one, one, the, the bumper sticker about Kennan, he's a person of enormous ability, enormous talent, but even greater ambition. And that, that sets up the frustration. And so he, when he's remaining basically a second-tier diplomat. He's risen far in the state, in the foreign service, but still a second tier diplomat. Uh, in Moscow, he's frustrated with the U.S. government. He frustrated with the ambassador who he feels is not listening to him, frustrated with Washington. And so his friends in the State Department, who at this point, the United States, the Truman administration is already veering sharply away from Roosevelt's policy of trying to collaborate with the Soviet Union. The Truman administration is veering sharply toward what would become the Cold War. Kennan was not aware of the extent of this shift already. And, but Kennan's friends in the State Department asked him to write, in response to one of Stalin's speeches, asked him to write a telegram laying out, how do we understand, how do we, how can we explain the, uh, the, uh, the supposed aggressiveness of the Soviet Union? What, what's happened to the alliance, wartime alliance? And so Kennan has basically been primed for doing this, right? I mean, he's angry at the American government, angry at the Soviet government. And Kennan, one of his problems was he was such a powerful writer, such an effective writer, that he often kind of, in a sense, overshot his goal, that he would prove something beyond what even he believed, but he was making such persuasive arguments that, you know, he, he ended up with something extreme. And that's basically the long telegram, which he dic dictated 
Washington's birthday on a Friday to a secretary who didn't want it, didn't want to be there. Um, five over almost six thousand words, in which he lays out a view of the Soviet Union as not just a challenge to America's national interest, but as an existential threat. And got that got attention in the State Department, and it was circulated around the Truman administration. On March 5th, this is February 22nd, the long telegram, March 5th, a few weeks later, the same day that Churchill gave his Iron Curtain speech, as a coincidence, but on March 5th, the State Department sent a long telegram to virtually every American embassy and consulate legation around the world. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Frank Costigliola. He is a board of trustees to Singer's Professor of History at the University of Connecticut, and we are talking about his book called Kennan, A Life Between Worlds. It is a biography and analysis of George Kennan, again, who has been considered to be the architect of the Cold War, who would also become its biggest critic uh, afterwards and even during it. The, the long telegram that's actually the name of this. It is a very long telegram. That's also the, the famous name of this writing that you're talking about, the long telegram. There's an interesting part in it in which he basically writes, and I, I found this fascinating, I think kind of instructive in world affairs and almost conflict ever since. And I don't think it's just the Soviet Union, but for him, Joseph Stalin uh, need, said he needed an outside enemy, needed the United States to be an enemy. Okay, I, I think that that's, that was not correct. That was not correct. I think that, you know, at times it was useful for Stalin, but Stalin wanted, Stalin, it's pretty clear to me, and from what I... um, You're saying Kenan, you're saying Kenan wasn't correct, or maybe my characterization wasn't? No, 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 your your characterization is correct, but I think Kenan vastly exaggerated that, because Stalin wanted to rebuild Russia and was afraid that the Germans and Japanese, particularly the Germans, would invade again. And Stalin initially wanted some kind of working relationship with Russia, he should working relationship with the United States and Britain. He wanted to control Eastern Europe, but on that basis that the West would control Western Europe, he would control Eastern Europe, and together they would, the West, the Americans, the British, and the uh, Russians would prevent Germany from rising up again, which he thought was the real, real kind of threat. But by Kennan saying that, that basically dismisses whatever Stalin is asking for or complaining about by saying, well, they just want an enemy. Kennan was doing there was dismissing any notion of legitimate Russian national interest. That you don't take it, you don't take when the Russians are complaining about American moves here and there, you don't take that seriously and say, well, they just want an enemy. Then that's not taking seriously the fact that they might have legitimate, from their point of view, legitimate national interests, legitimate objections to what the West was doing. And there's an analogy here today with people who I think uh, incorrectly totally dismissed Putin's argument that the expansion of NATO eastward was perceived by himself and by many other Russians as a threat to their security. If you dismiss that, then you say, well, the West is not at all responsible for what's the terrible situation that has occurred in Ukraine. Uh, not to say, that's not to excuse Putin's war, but the point is that the origins of that war, I think, have something to do with American and NATO actions before. But if you say that Putin is just saying that, and he he just wants an enemy, it's like Stalin just wanted an enemy, then that allows the whoever's saying that, in this case, the Americans, to uh, ignore the ways in which they've helped set up a situation which, to which the Russians have responded. We'll come back to the long game here in a moment, because I think there it is important to be talking about George Kennan in, in, in this moment that we're living in right now. But, but before we get there, I don't want to skip Article right, X right. either, because... I, so we had the long. There, there, these are these are two two important writings from George Kennan. The first one we talked about the long uh, telegram. The second one a year later. So long telegram is nineteen forty six. Right. A year February later. 46, a year, July forty seven. July forty seven. Article X. Yeah. It's, the, it's called the Mister X article okay. because it was published. He was in the State Department then. It's published in July forty seven, and it, it was published anonymously under X, but. Arthur Kroc was a big journalist, columnist, quickly revealed that that X was George Kennan, and that led to a rise in Kennan. Before that, he was known within the State Department for the long telegram. Now he was known within the country, at least the educated public, as the author of this article, which basically laid out what the Truman administration's policy was toward the Soviet Union. Containment. Similar, there's some differences. There's some differences between Mr. X and long telegram, but basically it's the same argument, two things. 
One is that the Soviet Union is an existential threat. Uh, actually, three things. One is that threat. Two, we can deal with them. We don't need to go to war. And we don't, do not need to appease them. Rather, we can deal with the Soviets by containing them. Right? And that's how the author containment doctrine. And three, in this, you know, also significant, three, Kennan said, if we do contain the Soviet Union, in the long run, they will, the Soviet Union will fall apart. And so the, he's famous for that prediction made in 1947, which of course came true in 1991. And th so again, this is containment. I mean, this is really the policy of, of Cold War. And this right. is what we, we get the articulation from Kennan in, in, in this X article. Right, correct, correct. And that would then largely, not, not word for word, as you point out, but then largely become policy-wise the mon uh the truman doctrine which again is is containment well yeah right but that then you begin to see the divergence between kennan and and the rest of the government because and you can see here how kennan in a way kennan always said he was misinterpreted he said the long telegram and mr x was misinterpreted by american officials who interpreted globally and he did not mean it to be interpreted globally he said and american officials interpreted it those two documents is meaning that the U.S. needed a military buildup. But I think Kennan was uh, fooling himself because he laid out the Soviet threat as being so existential that, of course, American officials believe containment should be applied globally on a worldwide scale. And, of course, American officials who just waged a global war, a total war against Germany and Japan, concluded that if we have this existential threat, we need to meet it in part in part by building up our military. So, but Ken always said he was misinterpreted, but in a way, he, you know, he basically invited people to the party and then they attended the party and he complained, why did you go to the party? <laughs> so, so it, was it, was it that his writings weren't, weren't clear on that point? Do you think his, No, it wasn't clear. It was clear. Be... I mean, I think you have to, remember I said before that the only thing greater than Kennan's in, uh, talents was his ambition. So he, when he was in Moscow, he wrote that long telegram to get people to ring the alarm bell really loudly so that he would gain attention and you know, be promoted and get the hell out of Moscow. I think at that point he wanted to get out. Uh, and that worked. And then so then he became, you know, kind of a uh, respected figure within the Truman administration. I'm talking about now late 46, early 47. And when James Forrestal, who's secretary of the Navy, first secretary of defense, uh, said, look, we need some kind of a statement, you know, kind of ideological statement to uh, for the policy that we're moving toward, which really was containment already, but we need a name for it. We need, you know, some intellectual legitimacy. Then Kennan wrote the Mr. X article, which was published in Foreign Affairs, really the kind of the establishment journal in terms of that kind of airing of public opinion in the United States. So in a way, both the Long Telegram and Mr. X, which was written by Kennan, with highly persuasive language, alarmist language, um, which he then, which later embarrassed him. But, you know, he did it because he was, he was concerned, but he was also very ambitious. What happened afterwards? So, as you mentioned, the Truman Doctrine. So, think about the timing here. So, the long telegram is published in, um, excuse me, the, Mr. X is published in July. The Truman Doctrine speech, which is actually in March 19. Uh, 47, Truman applied the doctrine of containment to the world. So said that any place in the world where there's Soviet aggression or Soviet infiltration and in promoting revolution, the United States will respond. Any place in the world. Kennan thought that was, that was dangerous, that the, it was impossible for the United States to police the world, to, to react with force or, or even politically, economically, every part of the world. Uh, Kennan thought certain parts of the world were important, the industrial areas, uh, the rest of the, a lot of, we kind of thought about certain areas of the world was if the communists took it over, good, that's their problem. Uh, you know, it, it was it certainly, to, to some extent, a racist idea that certain areas and certain peoples are less talented, less going to amount to much economically. And he had racist and, tendencies. He did. Yeah. He did. He did. And we can talk about that. Um, right. So, but he thought the Truman Doctrine was too expansive to... It was didn't have limits, which he thought it, U.S. foreign policy should have limits. But his Mr. X and Long Telegram didn't set those limits. So in a way, he is responsible for what, for what happened. 
partly responsible, partly responsible. So he almost he, he almost becomes uh, a critic immediately, uh, right, right? Right, right with Truman's I mean, speech of the announcement of this Truman. Uh, right. what would I mean, he, he doesn't Truman publicly criticize it because he's still on the rise within the Truman administration. But privately, he says this is this is a mistake. It's too too expansive. In many respects, he's a tragic figure. You know, the the the, the pride, the hubris, um, the talent in a way is also in part his his, his downfall. George Keenan was born in 1904. He died in 2005. So by definition, we're not going to get to everything. <laughs> he lived to be 101, so <laughs> impossible to get to everything. But but to move along the story for the purposes of our conversation, tell me about so we, a few years later, and I know there's a lot more in between. I'm going to sort of yeah, skip sure. World War II, the aftermath of World War II, his involvement in the Marshall Plan, which he was in, involved in. Right. Um, he was very much in favor of the Marshall Plan, which is restricted to Western Europe. And economic aid, rather than military, he loved the Marshall Plan, was not a fan of NATO. Not a fan of NATO. No, because again, that was a militarized uh, version of, um, of of containment, which he thought was not necessary. That with political and economic means, that was sufficient. And this is the creation of, of NATO. So he's, he's yeah, watching this. In 1949. This. So again, the Marshall Plan's uh, really proposed in 40, mid-47, it enacted and you know go into effect in 48 after that the uh, nato alliance in april 49 is he publicly criticizing the creation of nato at the time no no because he's still in the administration he's still a team player but he, he registers in his diary and in some memos and letters to close associates that he's wondering whether this is this is a good idea during the cold war does he ever publicly criticize nato oh yes yeah. yes he does um Again, because I think he saw NATO as, okay, here's an important point. Kennan saw containment as kind of an if-then proposition. If the Soviets are contained, then we should move toward negotiations with them and easing tension. If-then, okay? But, but the, if they're contained, then negotiations and compromise, which he thought was desirable. Because again, this is someone who loves the Russian people. He doesn't want a war with Russia. He really doesn't really want tension. With, with them either. So the goal of negotiation, compromise is always there. But for many American leaders, Truman and Atchison and probably a lot of the American people, the Cold War became an axiom. This is it. This is what this is what we have. the Soviet Union is a threat by definition and therefore we should not there's nothing to talk about unless they back down and, and surrender. So that's the difference between Kennan and the the thrust of American policy uh, really from 1950 onward, he leaves, he leaves the State Department officially in 1953, uh, but basically, was, well, he's ambassador to Russia for a few, period, a few months in 1952. But basically, after 1953, with a brief interruption when he's ambassador to Yugoslavia and the Kennedy administration, he's, he's a public intellectual who did criticize government policy. You know, I'm interested in what the fallout for him was during that time. Such a different time than we live in today. I, I remember being a teenager in, in in the late '80s, wearing a Soviet Union shirt just to be provocative, right? Because yeah. <laughs> it was daring at the time. What what was the fallout for him? And I mean, even more intense during during this period of time when he starts being critical of, of NATO in the Cold War. Was there a professional fallout for him over this? Well, yes. I mean, but Kennedy was also, I mean, he, he's um, interesting. If you look at the book, he, he, he's he's interesting. He's a person, he's, he's both establishment and anti-establishment. I mean, an example of this is that he, he's one of the first prominent critics of American involvement in Vietnam in televised hearings in February 1966. So he's criticizing American involvement in the Vietnam War saying that containment really does not apply to Southeast Asia. It's one of those big areas, wide spread, uh, wide, wide flung areas that Truman might have alluded to, you know, that's not really important from his point of view. Um, so he criticizes the Viet Vietnam War, but he's doing so dressed in a three-piece suit with a thick, heavy gold chain. You know, he's figuring, he's criticizing establishment policy as in a, a sense, a figure of the establishment. He's always closely involved with the Council on Foreign Relations. He publishes in Foreign Affairs. I mean, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s. So he's not, you know, this is not Jerry Rubin or Abby Hoffman. Um, you know, he, he's a critic, but he is also an establishment figure. Um, but that said, there's a, uh, 
there's an occasion in uh, late 1957, and I can talk about, I don't know how kind of detail you want to go into, but German, the U.S. policy was beginning to move toward uh, installing nuclear-tipped missiles in West Germany. And the Soviets, we knew, were going to respond by installing nuclear-tipped missiles in East Germany. This is 1957. Kennan thought that was a dangerous provocation. It would aggravate tensions over Berlin and so forth. And so Kennan made a series of radio addresses over the BBC, which he called for what he called disengagement. Disengagement, basically negotiations leading toward a mutual, a mutual U.S.-Soviet pullback from Germany, demilitarization and reunification of Germany, and basically allowing Europe again to be free of American and Russian occupying troops. He thought it was dangerous to have those troops eye to eye, turret to turret in terms of their tanks in the middle of Europe. So he made those radio addresses over the BBC. They were had an enormous impact, um, particularly in England, but then they were uh, translated into German. So impact throughout the Western world. Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev said, these are good ideas. We should pursue these ideas. So here's Kennan now really challenging America's uh, Cold War policies. And Dean Acheson, who was a retired Secretary of State under Truman, but still the kind of Mr. Uh, Democrat foreign policy expert and would have an influence on the Kennedy administration. Dean Acheson uh, launched this uh, well-orchestrated uh, public attack on Kennedy. Uh, published a, a lead article in Foreign Affairs in which he compared Kennan's uh, writings and thinking to the chattering of monkeys. I mean, that's that's quite a statement there. Hmm. Um, and there was a, again, there were a lot of other people came out and criticized John Forster Dulles, who's Atchison's enemy as a Republican Democrat. Atchison agreed that Kennan was way out of bounds. So there was the establishment pushback and not just criticized Kennan, but tried to humiliate him as being basically, you know, just a chattering ape. At the age of 99 in year 2003, George Kennan held a press conference opposing the Iraq war. In some yeah. ways, I think you argue, I've heard others argue, he sort of foresaw what was going to happen with U.S. policy, foreign policy. He did. He did. I mean, he, he was in general suspicious. Again, we go back to the Truman Doctrine. He thought, you know, what is the United States doing into, you know, sending troops and getting uh, intimately involved, dangerously involved in far flung areas of the world, whether that was Somalia, whether that was Iraq uh, or Vietnam. And he thought that th these interventions will come to, to no good and they'll just sap American energy, sap American resources, and uh, it, it would not work and uh, just be harmful to American interests. And, and he was right about that. In his attention that he paid to and talked about NATO expansion, did, did he talk specifically about getting close to Ukraine? Yes, he did. He did. Um, I've uh, written about this recently in a small, small article um, that, uh, yeah, there's an exchange of uh, views he has with uh, Strobe Talbot, who is at Clinton's uh, advisor on Russian affairs. And uh, these letters in Kennedy's papers, which people are online, online people can access them at Princeton University Libraries, uh, library, Mud Library at Princeton, um, in which Kennedy was saying, you know, this, uh, the expansion of NATO eastward is dangerous. And then he also, in this 1997, the 1997 now, this is way before Putin took Crimea and so forth, uh, he's saying that it's um, this incipient uh, military and naval cooperation between NATO and Ukraine is dangerous. Dangerous because the Americans in 1997 are trying to convince the Russians that the expansion of NATO eastward is not inimicable, not dangerous to Russia's national interest, not a threat to Russia's national security. And how Kennan asks, how, comma, Kennan asks Talbot, can we convince the Russians that NATO expansion eastward is not dangerous if at the same time we're expanding NATO eastward, NATO is also getting involved. It's on a small scale, but still getting involved militarily and navally with Ukraine. Would that then suggest, and you mentioned earlier, this isn't to forgive 
Putin and, and, and the invasion of Iraq or, or to let him not. off the hook. But but would this suggest that what we're seeing now potentially could have happened regardless of, of Putin, that this was predictable? Yeah. You, uh, Talbot in that, I don't know if he's going to listen to this broadcast, but Talbot in that, um, in a memo to Clinton in 1995, uh, I believe it's 95, said that virtually almost every informed Russian, I'm paraphrasing here now, almost every informed Russian is is not is not happy or, you know, regards, is unhappy about the expansion of NATO eastward. And Kennan, Kennan himself, as early as 1948, as early as 1948, Kennan said that any Russian leader will, if there's an independent Ukraine, any Russian leader will try to end that situation. That Russians regarded Ukraine as an integral part of Russia, just as Kennan said, just as Americans regard the Midwest as an integral part of the United States. Now, Ukrainian nationalism has developed to an extent, you know, way beyond 1948, way beyond 1991, Way beyond a year ago, you know, before Putin's unnecessary, unjustified invasion. But still, I mean, what Ken was talking about was the Russian perspective. That doesn't mean we accept that perspective. It does not mean at all we accept that perspective. But we need to understand it if we're going to deal effectively. It's it's more than just a madman, right? No, I think that that's perfectly perfectly true, right? And if I would just say if Putin is a madman, then we're in trouble. We're in trouble because there's nothing holding him back from using nuclear weapons if he is a madman. Uh, Fra Frank Castigliola, you, you are a renowned scholar of, of international relations yourself. How, how do you make sense? And then maybe even through your work on, on Keenan, you also back in 2014 published his uh, his memoirs. Um, no, his diaries. Or his, his, diaries, diaries. his diaries, forgive me. Um, yeah. How do you make sense of what we're seeing in Ukraine today? Oh, I don't know. You know, I don't know. As Kennedy would say, I'm not privy to the to the secret documents and so forth. It's a terrible, it's a terrible situation. I, I think, but I do think it was, again, I don't, I don't know, but I think it was preventable in the sense that it seemed to me that before this war started, um, Putin was saying, well, we don't want Russia joining Ukraine. Uh, NATO was saying, well, we don't intend actually for uh, Ukraine to join NATO. And everybody was saying that Ukraine was not going to join NATO. Ukrainians were saying, well, we're not going to join NATO. Uh, Putin was saying, we don't want you to join NATO. NATO was saying, we don't intend Ukraine to join NATO. It seems to me there, there was a possibility for some kind of negotiated guarantee that could, they could perhaps deal with some of Putin's fears, extreme fears that Ukraine would be, become more and more a security threat to Russia. That that might have. I don't know. Who knows? If that could. But have it seemed like that was off the thing. table, right? That that was off the table. While 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 nobody was trying to say Ukraine was about to become a member of NATO, it exactly. seemed like they were exactly. willing so to. So it seemed like there was a de facto agreement there. Why don't why not yeah. build on that? The other thing is that um, Ukraine was supposed to be more of a uh, federal state, which allowed for more independent aut autonomy. In, in the eastern areas where there is a large proportion of Russian speaking people. And, and don't forget, Ukraine was kind of put together from different kinds of territories. Some taken from Poland, even taken from Czechoslovakia, uh, traditional Ukrainian territory put together after World War II. So there are regional differences. And we all know the regional difference between, let's say, California and, and Florida, right? You guys know that, right? So the fact that we have a federal system enables us to have you know, Ron DeSantis is not governor of, of, of California, right? So that enables us to have some measure of domestic peace. Um, something like that might be advisable for Ukraine and might should have been imp implemented before. Do you think, and of course, we're, we're speculating at this point, um, right. asking you what you think a dead man would think right now. But but do you think, I mean, I get the sense you, you might think Kennan would, would be alarmed by the amount of military aid we're speaking. So I think so. I think I think he would. I think he would because I think it's it's also open ended. I mean, it seems that U.S. aid to Ukraine just in, just the discussion now of the tanks is, is very weak. Uh, is it's one direction only? It, it's, it's more greater number of weapons, greater degree of uh, sophistication of weapons in in one direction. And again, we better hope Putin is not a madman because 
uh, you know, his he's he's not justified in fighting Ukraine, not justified at all. But still, he is fighting in Ukraine, and he sees his enemy getting aided more and more by the West. I mean, we better hope he is restrained. We referenced some of the bigotry that was held by George Kennan earlier. I don't, I don't want to completely gloss over it. There, there were some papers of his that were found in which he uh, was against, uh, what, the right of vote for African-Americans, for right. women. Right. This is in 1938. Um, it's, it's racist. I mean, it's just out and out racist. Um, he, I think one thing to think about George Kennan, you know, the title of the, of the book is A Life Between Worlds. And one of the sets of worlds that his life was between was between the early 20th century and the early 21st century. He imbibed in Milwaukee in the early teens and in Princeton. And then he was in Riga and in Berlin, pre-Nazi Berlin. Prejudices against Jews, against African-Americans, uh, homophobic prejudices, which unfortunately Kennan adhered to for the rest of his life. Now, he, he modified his views somewhat, but still he he's somebody that you and I would could easily call a racist, and that's, there's no excuse for that. But it's part of the, you know, we, I talked before about Kennan having a perspective on the postmodern age and industrialism and so forth. You know, the, the value of Kennan as a person between worlds, the positive value is that he had insight into some of our dilemmas and the negative side of his life between worlds is that he held on to prejudices that uh, imbibed at an early age. Frank Castigliola has been our guest. Frank Castiglioga is Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. He has joined us to talk about the life and times and really all the interesting things that we could fit in 50 minutes about George Kennan, the considered to be the architect of the Cold War. Do you think architect of the Cold War is an appropriate term? Uh, I, I, as long as we had end critic. Yeah, end critic, as he was. <laughs> Frank Castigliola is the author of the book, Kennan, A Life Between Worlds. Professor Castigliola, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you, Mitch.